Mosasaurs were the ocean's ultimate predators until their fossil trail hits a hard red line at 60 degrees north and never crosses it again. It's not a digging error. Geological maps expose zones where even the toughest marine reptiles died mid-journey, stopped by invisible ocean death traps that still haunt us today. Why do their bones vanish with mathematical precision? Why does this pattern matter for life on Earth right now? Let's untangle the evidence behind why Mosasaur fossils suddenly stop here and reveal the five lethal barriers that rewired marine history forever. For decades, fossil discoveries were scattered clues, bones pulled from cliffs, handwritten labels, locations sometimes noted as somewhere near the river bend. Each museum drawer held a piece of the puzzle, but without a map, the pattern stayed hidden. That changed when researchers started digitizing every find one by one. Thousands of old field notes, faded ledgers, and even Polaroids were converted into digital records, with coordinates corrected down to 50 meters using satellite data. Imagine the chaos. A plesiosaur jaw logged as north of town, 1962, suddenly gets a precise GPS point, cross-checked against modern maps. Technicians and archivists worked through entire winters, updating records, linking fossils to exact layers of rock, and flagging any ambiguity for review. The real breakthrough came with Geographic Information Systems, GIS. Now every fossil, from Kansas to Kazakhstan, could be plotted on a single interactive map. Instead of a jumble of dots, clear lines started to appear. Mosasaur fossils clustered in dense swarms, but only up to a certain latitude. Beyond that, the map stayed eerily blank, no matter how many new finds were logged. It wasn't just a lack of digging. There were plenty of expeditions, plenty of rock, and plenty of prey in those northern seas. But the data held firm. The line didn't budge. Natalie Bardet's 2014 project became the gold standard. Her team assembled a global database, merging museum catalogs, field GPS, and even satellite imagery of outcrops. Every new specimen got a digital fingerprint, latitude, longitude, rock age, and a direct link to its museum drawer. When all the data came together, the result was a visual shock. Thick red lines where fossils stopped cold with white dots massed up to the edge and then nothing. No gradual fade, no thinning out, just a hard cutoff, as if the ocean itself had drawn a border. This wasn't a fluke. Every attempt to add new finds north of 60 degrees, blank. The map told the same story, over and over. The fossil record wasn't random. It was a forensic trail, and the boundaries were real. The question wasn't about missing bones anymore. It was about what killed everything that tried to cross those invisible lines. The map stunned everyone, but not everyone trusted it. As soon as those hard fossil cutoffs appeared, the scientific brawl began. In one corner, the sampling bias skeptics. Their argument was simple. Maybe the fossils just aren't there because no one's dug deep enough. Maybe the Arctic is hiding a jackpot under the permafrost. Or maybe field teams just missed the right outcrops. Journal articles from the 1990s to 2010 read like point-counterpoint chess matches. One side insisted, you can't prove a negative. Absence isn't evidence. The other fired back with spreadsheets, expedition logs, and statistical models that tore holes in the randomness theory. If it was just a digging problem, the odds of missing every single Mosasaur north of 60 degrees north after hundreds of documented digs were astronomically small. Debates spilled over at conferences and in peer review. Some paleontologists published rebuttals, arguing that museum collections are full of misidentified or mislabeled specimens so the map could be skewed. Others pointed out that the blank zones weren't just in remote, unexplored corners. They showed up in well-studied areas with decades of fossil hunting. When Bardet's database went live, it didn't just show missing dots. It showed thick red lines with fossil swarms up to the edge, then nothing. The data was relentless. 
Statistical tests rejected the idea of random distribution. The cutoff was too sharp, too consistent to be a fluke. The credibility battle got personal. Some critics accused the GIS crowd of cherry-picking data, while defenders published open access catalogs and invited anyone to check the raw records. The argument wasn't just academic. If the map was right, it meant something in the ancient ocean was killing off entire species at invisible boundaries. If it was wrong, decades of fieldwork and new technology had somehow built a mirage. The pressure was on. Prove that these lines weren't just artifacts of human error, but real traces of prehistoric catastrophe. That challenge pushed scientists to dig deeper, not just for more bones, but for physical evidence of what made those ocean walls deadly. The search for a cause had officially become a forensic investigation. At the northern edge of the fossil map, the story turns physical. Mosasaur bones from Arctic Canada and Denmark don't just stop, they show trauma. Micro CT scans from the Royal Tyrrell Museum reveal a pattern. Tiny fractures running through the limb bones. Calcium rings marking sudden metabolic shock. It's as if these animals swam into a wall of ice water and their bodies simply broke down. The temperature gradient wasn't gentle. In some places, the ocean dropped 15 degrees Celsius in less than 50 kilometers, a boundary sharper than anything in today's seas. For a cold-blooded reptile, that's like jumping from a hot tub straight into a glacier-fed river. The stress left scars in the bone, evidence preserved across millions of years. But cold wasn't the only killer. In Nevada's Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park, a different kind of death zone left its mark. Paleontologists excavated a bone bed where dozens of ichthyosaur skeletons lay stacked at a single sediment layer. Field notes from 1954 described the scene. Every skeleton pointed away from a greenish marl, as if the animals tried to escape something in the water. Thin sections of fossilized gills show cellular collapse, classic signs of hypoxia. These marine reptiles could hold their breath for 20 minutes, but the suffocation layer had zero oxygen. It's the prehistoric version of running a marathon, and finding the finish line is on the moon. Chemical markers back up the story. Redox-sensitive elements in the sediment spike right at the bone bed, confirming an ancient oxygen minimum zone. Modern dead zones work the same way. In the last 70 years, hypoxic regions in today's oceans have grown tenfold, squeezing fisheries and driving mass fish kills. The fossil record draws a straight line from ancient suffocation events to the expanding dead zones we're tracking now. The evidence is clear. These barriers didn't just slow marine reptiles, they stopped them cold. Bones fractured by thermal shock, skeletons piled at the edge of lifeless water all mapped with forensic precision. Two death zones down, three to go. Salt can kill just as efficiently as cold or suffocation. In the ancient Tethys and other seaways, the water sometimes turned into a chemical trap, hypersaline pockets so intense they acted like invisible minefields. Plesiosaurs, with their streamlined bodies and paddle-shaped limbs, were built for open ocean travel, but their kidneys had limits. Slide after slide from museum archives shows the same story. Salt crystals embedded deep in the fossilized kidney tissue, urate layers stacked like tree rings, and micro fractures from dehydration. Some specimens even preserve kidney stones the size of marbles, locked inside the rib cage. These weren't gradual failures. Crossing a salt trap meant your organs started shutting down before you reached the far shore. Evolution gave plesiosaurs the tools to filter salt. But these basins became Dead Sea 2.0, so concentrated that even the best adapted organs rage quit. The map overlays are brutal. Fossil distribution stops at the edge of ancient evaporite basins, thick red lines where white dots vanish. Sea level drops concentrated the salt even more, shrinking the habitable ocean and stranding whole populations. It's the ultimate dehydration test. Swim in, and your body pulls water from its own cells to try to survive. 
the evidence is locked in the bones. Renal pathology slides, salt inclusions, ebivalmas, and even stress fractures from the final struggle. But chemistry wasn't finished. Sometimes, the ocean turned acidic, literally, battery acid levels. Volcanic eruptions injected so much CO2 that pH dropped from around 8 to as low as 6. For anything with a shell, this was a death sentence. Deep sea drill cores from Peru's Site 1229 came up missing entire carbonate layers. Shell beds just dissolved away. Fossil free zones on the maps match these ancient acid belts perfectly. The biggest chemical hit came at the end Permian. Up to 96% of marine species vanished, mostly shell builders. That wasn't an extinction, that was a reset button. Geochemists track these events with boron isotope curves, tracing the pH crash right through the extinction interval. Today, ocean pH has already dropped by 0.1 units since 1850, a blink in geological time. Acidifying coastal zones are spreading, especially in upwelling regions. The chemical walls that once erased entire lineages are drifting back into the modern ocean. Salt and acid two invisible forces that drew hard boundaries in the fossil record and are starting to redraw them now. Some barriers don't kill with a shock or a chemical hit. They kill by emptiness. In the fossil record, there are places where bones just stop, not because the water turned toxic or cold, but because there was nothing left to eat. These are the ancient ocean food deserts created when currents shifted and nutrient highways collapsed. Scientists traced the evidence in the mud at the bottom of the sea. Drill cores pulled from the Atlantic and Pacific show layers almost empty of organic material. No plankton, no algae, barely any carbon at all. Geochemists track this with barium to aluminum ratios and total organic carbon. At certain extinction boundaries, those numbers nosedive. Some cores from the Cretaceous-Paleogene boundary show up to a 90% drop in export productivity. Imagine an ocean that once teemed with life suddenly going silent. The base of the food web vanished, and everything above, fish, ammonites, even the apex predators, starved out. Fossil maps tell the same story. White dots, mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, big predatory fish, cluster along productive coastlines and upwelling zones, but vanish in the middle of these barren stretches. No gradual fade, just a sharp cutoff. It's not a lack of fossils, it's a lack of food. And the evidence lines up. Wherever sediment cores show a productivity crash, the fossil record shows a matching death zone. This isn't just ancient history. Today, Oceanographers are recording a 15% weakening in Atlantic nutrient transport since 1990. That's already shrinking modern food webs and expanding marine deserts. It's the same mechanism, just on fast forward. The ocean's grocery stores are moving, and not every species can keep up. If prehistoric ocean maps are basically death zone maps, hit subscribe. We're showing you how ancient Earth actually worked, and it's way more brutal than you thought. Food deserts are the final piece of the death zone puzzle. When the currents changed, extinction followed. But sometimes the ocean didn't just kill with emptiness. It rearranged the entire map. Want to see how one piece of land can wipe out 70% of a region's marine life? Watch this. Five million years ago, Iyen Yerzo, the Atlantic and Pacific were still connected by a deep, warm water corridor, an underwater highway for everything from plankton to giant sharks. Then, tectonic forces started shoving land upward, grain by grain, as the future isthmus of Panama began to rise. For marine life, this was like watching a door slowly swing shut. Drill cores pulled from both sides of the seaway show the story in real time. Rich layers packed with coral, mollusk shells, and microfossils suddenly thin out replaced by barren mud. Within about two million years, the corridor narrowed to a trickle and the ocean currents went haywire. The Caribbean, once a crossroads of nutrients and species, became a cul-de-sac, 
sediment records track a collapse in export productivity. Organic carbon and barium ratios nosedive, signaling a food web in freefall. In some fossil groups, up to 70% of species disappear in just 500,000 years. That's not gradual. On a geological clock, it's a hammer blow. Coral reefs that had flourished for millions of years shrank to half their diversity. Mollusks and foraminifera followed. The extinction curve from Coates's drill sites looks less like a gentle slope and more like a cliff. The cause wasn't just isolation. The closure of the seaway rerouted ocean currents, shutting down the nutrient highways that fed entire ecosystems. Warm, plankton-rich water was replaced by cooler, nutrient-poor flows. Species that couldn't adapt or migrate simply vanished. The fossil record on both sides of Panama is a before and after snapshot. Abundant life, then a sudden drop. The lesson is brutal. When ocean barriers move, even the dominant species can vanish almost overnight. Ocean barriers aren't ancient history, they're moving right now. NOAA's Global Monitoring Network is picking up changes that would have stunned the old fossil hunters. Satellite data shows the Atlantic's nutrient currents have weakened by 15% in just 30 years. That's not a blip. That's the ocean's food supply shifting faster than most species can migrate. Dead zones, those suffocating layers that once stacked ichthyosaur skeletons, have exploded in size, now covering 10 times more area than they did in 1950. Real-time oxygen sensors are tracking the expansion, and the maps look eerily familiar. Sharp edges, blank zones, and marine life packed up to the line, then nothing. Temperature walls are on the move, too. Arctic waters are warming twice as fast as the global average, pushing the cold barrier north. For some animals, that's an open door. For others, it's a trap closing behind them. Ocean pH is dropping, especially along upwelling coasts. Scientists are logging acid zones that match the ancient kill belts, with shellfish and corals already dissolving in place. Every data set, from shipboard CTDs to satellite altimetry, points to the same trend. The invisible walls that once killed off mosasaurs and their neighbors are shifting faster than ever before. The difference this time? We're watching it in real time. The same death zones that carved hard lines in the fossil record are forming again. Only now, the timeline is decades, not millennia. Next episode, we'll show which modern ocean animals are running out of room and what happens when the walls close in. Thousands of mapped mosasaur fossils show an abrupt stop at 60 degrees north, a pattern confirmed by Bardet et al., 2014, and not explained by sampling bias. The evidence is clear. Ancient oceans were shaped by invisible barriers, temperature walls, oxygen-starved layers, salt traps, acid zones, and food deserts that killed even apex predators. Fossil bones with cold shock fractures, damaged gills, and salt crystal kidneys mark the exact places these animals failed to cross. Yet questions remain. How quickly did these zones shift? And what local factors made some regions more deadly than others? Today, satellite data shows similar barriers forming and moving as climate and chemical changes accelerate. The fossil record proves that when ocean walls move, dominant species vanish, regardless of their past success. Ancient oceans teach one lesson backed by the evidence. Survival depends on recognizing and respecting these hidden boundaries.